A lot is happening in the world of brain sciences today, and many experts say that now we might finally get on the right track to solving the mysteries and actually figuring out how the brain works. I have Gary Marcus here with me today. Gary is a neuroscientist at New York University. He's the author of several books about the brain, and he also blogs for The New Yorker about artificial intelligence. Gary, people have been studying the brain for some 200 years. You yourself have been in the field for two decades. What is different now that makes it an exciting moment for neuroscience? Well, first I'll say I think you're right. We don't know how it works. So there's an exciting moment that we might someday figure out how the brain works. There are a lot of techniques now that give us some new hope. So optogenetics is the first technique I would point to, which allows you to control the brain using laser light, basically. So you, you can make genetic modifications to neurons and be able to actually control them rather than just observe them. So if you think back to fMRI, for example, um, there we're just looking at the brain. It's just it's a correlation, but it's not causation. And the, the idea that we can actually cause circuits to do things gives us hope that we might be able to interpret them. And then there's a whole lot of other techniques, like some people in Berkeley are working on something called neural dust that allows you um, to be able to communicate ultrasonically with the brain. And so instead of having um, wires sticking through your skull and you have to mm -hmm. clean things all the time, you might have a permanent or semi-permanent implant. So all kinds of new techniques. Then there's all kinds of new data. Um, so the, the big data revolution is hitting neuroscience just the way it's, it's hitting everything else. It's becoming possible to analyze terabytes or exabytes of data that we have the machinery to, to store the data to start to analyze it. So I don't want to say that we're definitely there, but I think there's a lot of reason to think, hey, this might be a big moment. I see. So these techniques are thought to be fundamentally different from other techniques or the ways we were looking at the brain because the level of detail is Yeah, so a bit, another big difference I should have said is, is about the level of resolution. So if you think about an fMRI scan, your, your individual sampling unit is a voxel, which is like a pixel in a di digital image. And the problem is that your individual voxel has about 70,000 neurons in it. And what we want to know is like how do two or three neurons interact together or 100 maybe. But mm -hmm. um, 70,000 is like trying to understand politics from an airplane window. Like you're, you're just too far zoomed out. I mean, you can see, you know, there are more people in, in, in the blue states than the red states or something like that. But that's not going to tell you the individual dynamics of what goes on. And also how those neurons interact with other parts of the system. So we're in, in a better position now to look at long-term or long-distance connections across the brain, although we still got a lot of work there to do. Um, but we're in a better position to understand circuits. That's what, really what it's about, is we've understood kind of the abstract geography of the brain. So we know that you know, the left is involved in language. But that's not specific enough to say, how does it really work, or to allow us to fix something. So if I know that you have damage on the left side of the brain, I can predict that it's probably going to interfere with your language circuitry. But that's not the same thing as knowing in detail what's wrong so that I could go ahead and fix it. Um, mm -hmm. We have to get down to the single neuron level in order to be able to fix the brain, in order to be able to understand how it's working. And, and and there's reason to think that we're, we're kind of getting there, not just looking at one individual neuron, but sets of neurons in, interacting with each other like at a very detailed level. So it's pretty exciting. I see. So uh, many governments have stepped in now. Uh, here we have the Brain Initiative. Mm -hmm. We have the Human Brain Project in Europe, and many other countries are diving into the challenge. Um, some people compare this to the Human Genome Project or NASA's Apollo program. Do you think? these initiatives are going to have the same impact on the field? Uh, I think that they will. I mean, they're, I wouldn't say that these initiatives are perfect, so I've, I've been somewhat publicly critical um, of some of the details, but I think that it's a great time to be investing this heavily in neuroscience, and in fact, I would argue maybe we should invest even more. I mean, you think about how much we spent looking for the Higgs boson, that's something like seven billion or something like that. Um, the amount being spent on neuroscience, it's a lot, but it's not as much. And you could argue that the impact might actually be greater. I mean, I don't want to rile up too many physicists here, but if you think about the fact that half a billion people have serious um, brain issues, whether it's depression or schizophrenia and so forth, I think it's worth that investment. It might be worth double that investment or triple that investment. Um, I would pay a little more in my taxes to have us figure out how the brain works sooner. Yeah. Well, um, you said you are critical of some aspects. Um, I think I read that a couple of uh, European scientists were critical of the human brain project. That's because right. That, that one's gotten a lot of criticism. So to me, the, the thing I don't understand is that how can you simulate a brain, a human brain as a whole, when here we at Allen Institute, people are focusing on a tiny, tiny part of 
and mouse brain. The scales are too different. Well, I think that's part of what the backlash is about. So Henry Markram, who's running that initiative, gave this famous t TED talk maybe three, four years ago where he said, in a decade, we'll be able to build drugs by simulating the human brain. Instead of having to test them on people, you'll be able to just simulate them. And I think most people think that's an unrealistic hope. There are some people who think we'll be able to do it eventually in 50 years or 100 years. Some people who think we'll never be able to do it. And very, very few people who think we can actually do it to that level in a decade. I think we make real progress. I've been over there um, to Lausanne where those people are working. They'll be moving to Geneva. Um, and I think that, you know, they're good people doing good work that will be useful. But right now they're more at the level of like, let's build an infrastructure so we could simulate a brain. But not, mm -hmm. we don't have the data to actually build a full brain simulation. As, as you point out, like the Allen Institute, they're trying to just get like a cubic millimeter of mouse brain to try to understand what that is. And if they can do that in the next four or five years, they'll be very happy. To, so the leap from there to a full brain where it's harder, to, full human brain, where it's much more complex and it's harder to gather the data and so forth, that's a big leap. And I, I think part of the debate is like, do we really want to put all the, our money into a big simulation that maybe isn't plausible yet, or are there other ways to spend the money? Do we want to spend it all on simulation? Are there experiments that are maybe going to be less likely to be funded? Mm -hmm. Then there's a debate about is it zero sum? So, you know, where would this money have gone otherwise? And the people in the Brain Project will say, well, otherwise it would have gone into robotics or it would have gone into chemistry. Um, it's not taking away from other neuroscience research. It's hard to really even evaluate that from the outside. That's part of what the debate is about. I see. So someday we're going to have a lot of data, more than we can ever imagine. What are we going to do next? How can we make sense of that data? Well, that's part of where I've been critical. Is I've said there's a lot of money being spent to gather more data, develop new techniques, and I think that's great. But the way in which people talk about data analysis is pretty unsophisticated, I think. So it's sophisticated at the level of like, how do you get a large cluster of machines to do all this at once? People are, are doing um, good things there. My co-author, Jeremy Freeman, is, is one of the leaders in that. Um, but that's not the same thing as having hypotheses about how the system as a whole works. So you, you see um, behind me a, a picture of a, like a still shot from a movie uh, that's showing you a larval zebrafish you know, swimming around and, and, and you can look at 80% of the brain. We have in, in the book we have a couple chapters, one by Jeremy and one by Misha Ahrens, who, who's the kind of leader of this work. So you have this enormous amount of data already. I mean, it's exabytes of data, um, depending on what you're collecting. But you watch this movie and you don't really know exactly what's going on. I mean, it's clear that something's going on. It's clear that it's exciting. You know, you're seeing the brain in beautiful. action. It's absolutely beautiful. But interpreting that, well, we need ideas of, to you know, even get started about what it, what it means. So how do we go about finding those ideas? Should we have a department of ideas for brain sciences? I actually think, I mean, that's a good question. I, I think that what we need is a culture change, actually, in neuroscience. So neuroscientists are often trained to work on very small, detailed things. I and mean, people use the word silo sometimes. So, you know, this person works on this molecule and how it's transported in this synapse. And that work needs to be done. But people tend to get really expert at that particular thing that they're doing. The grant structure reinforces that. So if you are working on a grant that's quite similar to what you've already been doing, it's a minor tweak, then you're likely to get the grant. But if you're working on a grant where you're going to collaborate with six different people that you've never collaborated with before, people are going to say, that's too risky. But I think that's the kind of risk we need. I think we actually need to promote risk taking where people in very different fields, engineering fields, cognitive psychology, uh, and, and basic neuroscience all interact together. I think that we need to have more institutes devoted to theoretical neuroscience, and I think they have to be more inclusive. One problem has been that they've been driven mostly by physics, and physics has a particular view about how the world works and a particular set of techniques that work, but the brain is part of biology, not part of physics, and it's part of psychology, or psychology stems from it. I think we need to have more psychologists on board um, trying to make the theories instead of like trying to look for a grand unified theory of the, the brain where there'd be like three principles and we can derive the rest. It's not going to work that way yeah. because of the accidents of evolution. It's going to work that there's a lot of idiosyncrasy um, that we need to work out. And we need people that are more comfortable in that side of the theoretical continuum to be on, on, on deck. And we need all hands on deck.